This is a plug. And last year, research revealed that 8 out of 10 modern men are not entirely sure how to wire it up. And this is where man finds himself these days. 10,000 years in the making. 10,000 years of endeavour in science and the arts and the humanities. And within one generation, he's been reduced to a feckless, bedwetting, parmesan-shaving imbecile who revels in his own uselessness. Something has to be done. <laughs> Welcome to Man Lab, the gruelling arena in which the terminal decline of man will be arrested and possibly even reversed. In this humble industrial building, we will revive and relearn the skills that defined man and drag them glittering onto a broad sunlit upland of being a proper chap. Well, we'll be doing some woodwork anyway and maybe a bit of plumbing. Man Lab is an emergency service, on call to jumpstart the stalled evolution of man. <laughs> it's a bloke's base camp for an epic assault on the north face of Mount Muttonhead, a repository of ingenuity and invention from which man will emerge blinking, yet triumphant, armed with only a decent toolkit and a slim volume of English poetry. It's the modern face of the gentleman's club, where things get done properly and are followed by a proper pint. It's excellent. In short, this series, and this alone, will sweep away the confusion that has reigned since the dreadful dawn of moisturiser and the male makeover. End of mission statement. <laughs> But first, and never again, a quick tour of our house. This is our workshop area. This is my friend Sim, who will be helping to redefine the male species, mainly in plywood. I'm afraid he's rather untidy. Over here, we have our cement mixer, but don't let this put you off. We are going to be making some improvements to the man lab, noticeably to the lavatory area, but this is not a makeover show in any way whatsoever. We will not be re-theming anything in a Mediterranean style with terracotta. Oh, no. This cup of tea is now empty, which means it should be a simple matter to simply walk into the kitchen and make another one, except we don't actually have a kitchen. But we have allocated an area for a kitchen here, and we're going to be making ourselves a very, very fashionable island unit, hopefully with a concrete worktop and all the modern facilities, so that we can make tea and manwiches at will. And finally, here is our rest and recuperation area. Everything that a chap needs to relax, uh, some trendy retro sofas, a table, mysterious unmendable motorcycle, shelves, various strange knickknacks, and a kumbaya tambourine. Right, let's get on with something. Something useful and relevant. Now, the British people are very, very good at digging. It's why we're such excellent gardeners, and it's why we're so good at escaping from prisoner of war camps. But what if you were in your garden digging the foundations for your new extension and you came across an unexploded World War II German bomb? <laughs> Here is our unwanted gift from Klaus. It's a faithful copy of a 1940 Luftwaffe 250 kilogram bomb, complete with payload, genuine World War II fuse and clockwork timing device. Today, I'm going to show you how to defuse it, in case you find one. But what are the chances of that? How likely is it that your spade of burning gold will strike the cold steel of vanquished Nazi ambition? Here is a typical Victorian London street, yet amongst the houses we see things that were obviously built after the war. There, for example, and right there. This is where bombs fell. We know this because of records that were kept at the time, and they would have been dropped in what is known as a stick. They fell at regular intervals. Bang! Bang! Beyond that, bang! Undoubtedly, another modern building. 
But here's the alarming statistic. It's reckoned that one in 10 of those bombs didn't go off. An average of 85 dud bombs fell on British civilian targets every day. The first thing to understand is that, unlike the Olympics, bomb disposal is not a mass participation event. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear that I really am alone in the pit with the bomb. All the cameras on which you are watching me that I can address, like this one and this one, they're all completely remote. The film crew are miles away over there. I've got a chest camera as well. Here it is, so you can see what I'm doing. There's a good reason for the film crew to take cover. While our man lab bomb does not contain 250 kilograms of TNT, it is fitted with a small explosive charge and it's packed with a hideously inhumane payload. A deadly mixture of Peter Andre's new perfume, conditional pour homs, <coughs> and cow poo from the Garden of England. Careful, careful. This bomb will go off if I make the slightest error. As a result, I'll need to know exactly what makes it tick. Somewhere on the sides of our jerry bomb will be a fuse pocket like this one here. And in that fuse pocket, there will be an elektrische Aufschadzunder, or an electrical condenser resistance fuse, exactly like this one. This is the extremely popular Type 17 model. At the base of the fuse is a solid plug of penthrite wax, highly explosive, known as the gain. When the bomb was dropped from the aeroplane, a small burst of electricity was passed to the fuse through the charging head here, and from there it was ready to fire the gain, and with it, of course, the entire bomb. Now, that could happen on impact, or it might happen after a delay affected by this internal clockwork mechanism. And this could run for anything between 30 seconds and 74 hours. And if we could just put aside for one moment the notion that this is all a horrible device designed to spread dreadful death and destruction, it has to be acknowledged that this bit of German engineering, as usual, is absolutely exquisite. It's a piece of mechanical poetry, in effect. It's, it's such a shame, really, that it had to be used for something so, so terrible. I must overcome this clockwork timer, or the bomb will explode and the results will be unthinkably stinky. Now, a statistic released a while back suggested that the average British household kitchen lasted no longer than five years before being replaced. But here at Man Lab, we like to choose once and choose well. So we're going to build a kitchen that will last for a thousand years out of concrete. The kitchen will be the first of a series of ambitious improvements to Planet Man Lab. To achieve true millennial permanence, I'm going to need specialist help. And mine comes in the unshaven and loosely defined shape of Simi, inspirational inventor, builder and architect. What a piece of work is a man, wrote Shakespeare. He may have meant Sim, who was so committed he had already built the mould for our kitchen before I'd turned up. Now, in order to cast the worktop in concrete, we have to think of the worktop in reverse in order to make a mould, which is what Simmy's done here. So you can see that is the drainer. So what is normally an indentation is now proud, because obviously when the concrete comes out, it will then be an indentation. And that is where the sink will go. That is the sink. And this is where the hob will go. Those are the rough holes for the taps. Yep. This is not a proper mould. We're going to have to break it apart to get the, uh, to get the top out. Right. So it's a one-shot deal, this. If it doesn't work, there'll be something else in the programme at this point next week <laughs> about uh, building some prefabricated units bought from a high street kitchen shop. There cannot be a more noble material for the construction of a kitchen than concrete, a self-setting soup of cement, gravel, sand and water, functional and refined, and completely impervious to the vagaries of fashion or the weather. It is worth pointing out that the making of concrete was one of the great forgotten man's skills, because the Romans, of course, could do it, and then it took us until, well, about 
1860, something like that, to rediscover it. Although it is fair to say that Britain has never really fallen in love with this most mouldable of building materials. It is very true that concrete got a bad rap, especially during the 70s and 80s, as being an ugly material. But I don't think that is true. I think used correctly, it can be rather wonderful. It tends to be an ugly colour, but you can make it into very interesting shapes, because you can make it pretty much any shape you want. This is true. You should never use it as the surround for a bonfire, because it explodes, because it has little bubbles of water in it, or sometimes quite big ones, and obviously when they heat up, they become steam, but they're under pressure because they're enclosed, and then at some point, kabang, and you get bits of concrete flying all over the place. For the next two hours, Simi and I continue to fill our kitchen mould. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. Anyway, I think you've got the general idea and you've probably seen enough of me and Simi mincing around with trowels. So, we'll come back to this when it's set and we break it out. And in the meantime, I'm going to put a different shirt on and reappear in our sitting area for something else. Here is the shirt and the something else is about boiler repair. Or so it might seem. See, most people just get to the point... My where boiler repair lecture should have been the highlight of the Man Lab year. This on the older boiler, the, the Z736R. But something was wrong with Charlie, our researcher, a man who normally daydreams in British thermal units. It's a plug-in module, it's a sealed unit, like, you know, various... Today, he was dreaming in cheesy Rachmaninoff. Charlie. Charlie! Poor Charlie is lovesick. Thanks. He's limping around uselessly with Cupid's golden arrow lodged firmly in his trousers. So I have no choice but to take him to the local centre for male counselling. Oh, thanks, mate. Right. Tell me all about it. Well, I can't stop thinking about her. Uh, she's uh, everything I do at work. I keep getting distracted just by her being there. And then I'm looking at her. I just think I just want to be spending some alone time with her. And I just need, I just need her to see me for who I am, not just this person at work. I need to, I need her to oh, realize. Oh God! What I, I can't listen to this snivelling about inner you know, feelings any longer. To see, to it's time to instruct Charlie like, in the art I of seduction. You know, I need her to see. <laughs> I'm wondering, because I bet no one else is, if Charlie has ever thought of the lost art of the serenade. You see, I'm quite well positioned to advise you on this one, Charlie, because many, many years ago, I was a minstrel, and I serenaded people, because back in the 1970s, it was very fashionable to have a themed banqueting hall, Restoration or Elizabethan, and I walked around singing to people, accompanying myself upon the guitar. For example, Fair if you expect admiring, dear if you provoke desiring, grace, dear love, with kind requiting. That is Thomas Campion, 1567 to 1620. The remarkable thing about this was I couldn't play the guitar, and in fact I still can't, but here is a little trick for other would-be minstrels and serenaders. Normally the guitar is tuned E, A, D, G, B, E, which makes the fingering very tricky, but I have tuned this simply to open perfect fifth. And by this simple expedient, you can play sort of any chord you want by simply moving your whole finger up and down the fretboard, a musical technique known as cheating. I'll fly to thee again and sue for pity to renew my love's distressing. Got it? <laughs> Have a go. Try Thomas Campion, 1557 to 1620's Fair If You Expect Admiring, the original Elizabethan lute song upon this cheating guitar. Fair if you expect admiring, sweet if you provoke desiring. That, that one? Yep. Gra Grace. Grace, dear, love with kind requiting. You cannot come out of this badly. 
I'm not sure, but um, I'm definitely going to have to change the words. I don't think they're relevant anymore. Fair Actually, I was going to say, so as you don't spoil the surprise for the viewers, why don't you go and practice in the office? Now, as a chap, I'm sure you own a stout pair of boots. I certainly hope so. But what sort of condition are they in? Not that good, I'd wager. So, stand by to stand by. Top tips from people who know better. This is Platoon Sergeant Mark Buckingham of the Prince of Wales Royal Regiment. His boots are so shiny, he can see the Queen of England's face in them. These are a standard set of drill boots, ammo boots we call them, brought especially for today. After about 10 hours, spread out over a couple of weeks, that's what you can achieve. And they're ready for Buckingham Palace. Fantastic. These boots are owned by our slovenly producer, Rebecca, and they're disgusting. Our challenge, to restore them. It's a big job, this, so I'm going to do the left boot and the sergeant here is going to do the right boot. And then at the end, he can decide whether or not I've won my Man Lab boot badge. Go. Grab your boot brushes, you need one on, one off. Polish on, polish okay. off. You take your own brush, the dark one, and all you're going to do is take a generous scoop out of there onto your brush. Big scoops. There's no neat circles or anything like that. No, you just throw the polish on. OK, that's enough on. Take your off brush. That's the other brush, James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Now you're going to do... Let's do exactly the same again, but this time you're taking the polish off. OK, a common mistake that people make when they're doing their boots is that they think they're actually shining the leather. What you need to do is build up a substantial layer of polish, and then that's what becomes shiny. All we're going to do next is I need you to grab a cloth. With that cloth, I need you to wet it. Do you bring your mum's tea towels for? I need a proper cloth. Cameraman. Thanks. OK, chuck that in the cup of water over there. Give it a good ring. You don't want it dripping. It needs to be damp. Take a tiny little dot of polish on the end. Make sure it's wrapped tightly around one finger. That's just a mess. Look, tight. There you go. All right, OK. Take the boot, and what we're going to start doing is small circles. Too small okay. and you'll be there all week. Too big and you won't achieve the desired effect. And what we're looking for is a swirling effect on the polish and repeat the process. And then you finish it with the brush? No, you just keep going. Oh, is it this point in the programme where we have one of those balls that comes up that says, sometime later? What do you think? Just move that brush out of the way so I can have a proper look at your boots. Well, I just put that there to artfully dress it for television. I'll tell you what, I'll just take a quick look at it. Oh. I missed a bit, I'm sorry. Did you think that after 10 years in the army that I wouldn't notice a boot brush sitting on a boot on an inspection and not think that must be hiding something? I should have expected it from a civvy. Take a fail badge. Is that because I completely missed it or was there something on there that stopped it? No, I expect yeah. you put polish on, but you didn't put enough on like I told you to. Because right. you're weak. It's the most damning thing anyone's ever said about me. <laughs> if you were watching earlier on, you would have seen us cast this in Simi's one-use homemade wooden mould. If this doesn't work, we're going to have to start again because this will be broken as it's taken apart. Um, it's had three, nearly four days to set, isn't it? Yeah. And it's looking very good on this side, but this, of course, is the underside. It's how it looks on the other side with the cast-in draining board and so on. Should we start? Yeah. Just so you know, by the way, there's no TV jeopardy at work here. This genuinely is the first time we've seen this, and it may be terrible. Ooh! <laughs> Do we need more people, seriously? Yeah, if there was people standing around doing nothing, it's... Well, there's the director, for example. He's not doing anything. <laughs> Back to the end of the bench. That's probably enough. Well, we're going. Don't go. Keep going, keep going, keep going. That's not bad. That's 
brilliant. That is no, actually, come on, that's great. That is actually quite good. That's very cool. Well, I'm going right and down. With our culinary colossus in place, it remains only to drizzle it lightly with fixtures. It is, I believe, very cool, the cast concrete worktop, and I think it will catch on because it's industrial, it's rustic, which people like, and it is entirely functional. It is not in any way decorative or artistic. There is but one task left, failure to complete which will leave us back where we were at the start of this program. So we do have to wire up our hob, which involves putting a plug on it. But there is a handy maxim here for you to remember. Brown is live, blue is not, green and yellow earth the lot. It's actually completely useless because you can, you can get it wrong and say blue is live. Hang on, have I got it wrong? No. With brown, blue, green and yellow correctly rooted, we're ready for the red glow of progress. Right, should we give this a whirl? Yes. Wait for it. Look at that. It's like a sun rising. Hang on a minute. Who bought this? Oh. Colander. Look at that. It says vegetables, grapes, beans, peas, fruits. It's idiotic and it's wishy-washy and left-wing. Beware this sort of thing in your life. That is an affectation, an ornamental device for the kitchen. Our kitchen is not going to be like that. Our kitchen only has genuinely useful aerospace standard equipment in it. There is no place in our kitchen island unit for the vapid or the vacuous or the couscous. But there is something missing, and here's a small clue. This is a truly unique kitchen. Not only is it home cast out of attractive concrete, it also incorporates the controller for a train set. Exactly why that is will become clear later in the programme, but you can be fairly confident that it's got something to do with the train set. Meanwhile, though, out in the garden, there's still a big bomb in a hole. I'm alone in the pit, with a replica German bomb packed with celebrity male fragrance and cow poo. The film crew are hiding at a safe distance, and remote cameras have been positioned to capture the action. The first thing you must do is scrape very carefully around the bomb to locate the fuse pocket. Be very careful as ever not to disturb anything. There you go. There is the bomb fuse. What you must do next is go into your shed, rummage around amongst the half-empty tins of paint and those useful offcuts of wood and find your highly sensitive bomb disposal stethoscope. Here's mine. Hold it very still and hold the probe to the fuse. And I can hear ticking. I can hear ticking very loudly, which is bad news because that means the bomb was disturbed during the digging and the clockwork fuse has started running again. That means I have anything between 30 minutes and 74 hours to deal with this. So without further ado, you must next sally forth to the local hardware shop to buy your DIY bomb disposal kit. Follow me. Luckily, every self-respecting hardware shop should stock everything you need to defuse a common or, in our case, garden bomb hazard. Morning, sir. Sorry about the wait. Can I help? That's right. Yes, sir. You have a pot of salt. Yep. A small pair of scissors. Yep. A length of plastic tubing, six millimetres. Yeah, I've got some of that. A hand-operated vacuum pump. Yep. A small bicycle pump. A lump of putty. Yep. A hand drill. A four millimetre drill bit, high-speed steel. Titanium tip, sir. Mm, lovely. Now, the, the last thing I need is uh, I need a small needle self-tapping at one end in order to go into a four millimetre drilled hole, but I need the opposite end to be ribbed to accept the six millimetre tubing. So just have a look upstairs. OK. Was it for bomb disposal? Yeah, it is. It's uh, type 17, 1940. OK, I won't be a moment. It's quite urgent. 
By one of the great strokes of good fortune that attend the making of television programmes, the hardware shop did have a self-tapping needle. Now to defeat fascism using the only language they understand, salty water. The first thing we must do in the barrel of the pump is make up a saturated salt solution. The salt in the solution will jam up the clockwork mechanism, therefore stopping the clock. OK, that's ready for use. Taking your pot of putty, you need to form this into two pieces. One, a sausage shape, like so, and then I need to make a pancake. The reason for all this will become clear in a moment. Now for the really tricky bit. I have to drill into the fuse here, between the locking ring and the edge of the fuse itself, this will give me a hole leading down into the fuse pocket. This has to be done very, very delicately. Do not entertain any ideas of getting the electric drill out of the garage. That would be disastrous. This is actually the most hazardous part of the operation. I'm about three millimetres in. I think I've got it stuck. very important not to subject it to any sudden shocks like that. That's it. I have a hole. Now I have to create a vacuum in the pocket where the fuse sits. Now the most important piece of kit, the self-tapping needle. But now this must very carefully screwed into this hole. I form the shaped putty into an airtight seal around the fuse. I could murder a cup of army tea. The film crew realise this and send me a completely empty gesture of support. Thank you. Anyway, we take the hand vacuum pump now goes over the end of that. Right, I'm looking to create a vacuum of around 25 inches of mercury inside the fuse pocket. I'm nearly there already. And as soon as that happens, I flip the valve, introduce the salt solution into the fuse pocket. Here we go, invert and move valve. That's looking good. Now we cut this off, normally you'd pull it off. There isn't time for that, and it also might introduce a shock. Put that to one side, take my children's bicycle pump, insert it in the free end of the tube, give it a couple of strokes to pressurise it. And there it is, I can see a tiny bit starting to leak out there. The thing is full of salt solution, which means I will gum up the meticulous clockwork of the Third Reich. If I've done this correctly, a mass of stalwart British salt crystals will form inside the fuse, encrusting the clockwork mechanism and seizing it up. Right, now there's nothing for it but to wait 45 minutes for all that to work. Earlier on, Charlie was preparing to serenade the cold-hearted Cassandra with Thomas Campion, 1567 to 1620s, fair if you expect admiring. He's now ready to enter the garden of earthly delights, or at least the little grassy bit just below the balcony of her flat. Right. <clears throat> Thing to remember, I reckon, is that everybody secretly wants to be serenaded. OK. okay? Unless it's in a Greek restaurant, mm -hmm. then it's really annoying. Okay. Right, you've got your words. Yeah. Solo tapes on your loot. Yeah. You ready? Yes. Right. Go. Good luck. Thank you. I've taught Charlie everything I know. He can now play the guitar convincingly with one finger. He knows the greatest serenade ever written. He knows Cassandra's address, thanks to Ye Book of Faces. 
Now it's time to see if he can bring his Juliet to the balcony. Fair Cassandra, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't trying. Grace this moment just by smiling. I feel like a proper Charlie. I've not got hair like Bob Marley. And this loot song I'm defiling. If you come to lunch as I've requested. What did I tell him? It works. The Ice Maiden emerges, unable to believe her luck. She looks down and, as requested, she smiles. Arrested. How soft the moonlight sleeps upon this ba Charlie? <laughs> Running away like a big Jesse is never mentioned in any of the verses of Thomas Campion, 1567 to 1620. Surely he was supposed to fly to her again and sue for pity to renew his hopes, distressed. In sooth, this could take a while. Our forefathers were the sort of chaps who could turn their hands to pretty much anything. I wouldn't dream of calling it a professional, except as a last resort. But what about today? I know a bloke who rang a builder to come and screw his wine rack to the wall. Are modern men really that useless? To find out, we're going to test a member of the most cosseted fraternity in Britain today, the male celebrity. Award-winning comedian Alexander Armstrong claims he has a secret practical skill that any man would be proud to possess. Since he was a lad, Alexander has been obsessed with the underground sport of flat-pack furniture assembly against the clock. Right. Today, he will try to beat his personal best, set at the 1998 Stockholm Championships, for Malm, voted the most complex chest of drawers in the world. This exclusive attempt will be overseen by me in the ManLab Monitoring Centre, where I can offer tips and encouragement via a two-way intercom. OK, I'm going to lay it all out. Good. No, I'm not going to lay it all out. Bad. I'm going to read what I should... Better. The rules are simple. He must beat his personal best time, but a five-minute time penalty applies for any schoolboy error. Armstrong is an impassioned spokesman for this little-known sport, promoting it tirelessly around the country in disguise. When I started going out with a woman who is now my wife, one of the first things I did was assemble a chest of drawers for her. I can't remember how long it took me, but I got the job done. Look, I'm being really good here and taking careful note of which holes these screws are meant to be going into. Good. See, a lesser, a lesser DIY person would, uh, would probably just go on in there like in a bull in a china shop and uh, <laughs> maybe be paying the price later. He's going to claim that he can't find a piece or that it's missing. It is a, it's a very satisfying process until you suddenly find you have your missing piece of kit. That's when it gets tedious. 26 minutes in, it is a superlative performance, until... I started nailing there without pushing this flush against the, uh, this edge. Schoolboy error. It is a schoolboy error. Five minute penalty. But just as the build is back on track, up rears that old enemy of flat pack excellence, complacency. I'm going out sort of giddy sense that we're still coming together. Quite a lot of horses fall on the home straight. Yeah, thanks. I'll bear that in mind. Have you put that last one in the right way round? It looks from here like you've got brown inside. James, you're a you're a lifesaver. That would have been been a disaster. Still a schoolboy error, though, sorry. Oh, I see that counts against me, right, yes, good. When you first pick up a bit of kit and it seems completely the wrong way around, then you notice that, of course, there are two sides to a chest of drawers. Uh, the components are, to use the technical jargon, handed. They're handed, exactly. That's, you see... Thank God I don't know words like that. <laughs> Good. Uh, the 
construction. Oh, 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 oh. Ah. Oh, there we go. Oh, he's done it. There we are. Send in the butler. Hey, look at that. Job done. Thank you. I'll go and sew that onto my swimming trunks. <laughs> that is a stupendous time and shaves fully five seconds off his previous best chest of drawers performance, making him a worthy recipient of our pro celebrity man task badge and a great ambassador for the sport. Wow. That was fun. Maybe you've had fun. If you have, why not write to us? Send your message to ManLab, all one word, at BBC full stop co full stop UK. And remember to mark your subject line. I had fun. Meanwhile, though, this. Now, if you were paying attention earlier, you may recall that we were threatening to do something with a train set. Remember, the man lab includes this seating area, but also our kitchen, an extensive workshop, the lavatory block, my office, and so on. And there will be a huge movement of goods and materials between all these places. And obviously, I could just get up and walk over there to get a cup of tea, but why? Why not build a supremely efficient railway system to take screwdrivers and peanuts and whatever from place to place? So that is what we're going to do. Now, the railway will go in this direction. It's going to sweep round to run alongside the wall all the way down here. Ignore the pieces of junk. This is stuff that we've inherited with our man lab. As with the real railway, we have to deal with the world the way it is. We'll negotiate these obstacles around here, past the cement mixer, and then it's going to go through tunnels we're going to make in the wall into the lavatory area. Next, the train will emerge from this tunnel that we will build over here from the lavatory block into the office running behind my desk. These are the bits of the railway on here. This is what I'm going to use to make it. Our train now steams out of the office through this complex series of curves. A genuine domestic integrated transport solution, laden with consumables to sustain man and engineering materials to further his lot. We have developed a modern version of what in the early days of railways would have been called a bell signal system. Here is the master box. There's one in the kitchen. There's also one over in the seating area. Every station has a little bell push. You press it, it goes bing bong. So, let's say it was me in the office. I'm number three. Number three, they know James in the office wants the train. The person in the kitchen thinks, righto, off we go. Set it to depart. And there goes the train to me in my office. Now, whoever is in the kitchen can't see when the train has arrived in the office, but that's OK, because I can see it arrive, and then... I know from my crib sheet that a bong when running means stop. I bong, it stop. Perfect. Now, I take a little notepad from the train and I write down that I would like, please, a banana. So I'll just simply write banana and pop it back in there. Now we can see from the instructions that if I gave one bong, the train would continue in the direction it was already going in. But I don't want to do that. I want to send it backwards. The signal for that is two bongs. The person at the other end has to listen carefully, see how many bongs there are. So I go... Off it goes with my request for a banana. Here comes the train. It's going to hove into view any second. I'm ready to stop it. Bong when running. Stop. Bit of an abrupt stop, but never mind. There is my banana. I haven't had to walk anywhere.
Our monolithic kitchen risks becoming little more than a concrete white elephant, whose only culinary success to date has been the delivery of a melancholy banana to a melancholy bloke in his melancholy office. <laughs> its gleaming hob, sink and oven remain unused, its virgin worktop unblemished by the hearty produce of surf and soil. But now, with hunger raging in the bellies of our stout man-lab yeomanry, it's time for our kitchen to cement <clears throat> its reputation as a crucible of cordon blur creativity. I'm going to show you how to make a fish finger sandwich. You need five fish fingers for a standard fish finger manwich and two slices of nice, stiff, old-fashioned white bread. So, five fish fingers in the pan. They take five to six minutes per side, depending on how crispy you like them. Give it a little swirl. Whilst they're cooking, we can consider the garnish, which is going to be um, sauce tartare. The ingredients for this are a healthy blob of salad cream, Oops. Sort of about a tablespoon of that. James? Yes, um, director. You've broken the glass. It's only a crack. My mum would say that harbours germs, and it will do over time, but it was only broken like 40 seconds ago. Does it? Do you really want me to start again? I think so, yeah. <laughs> you might have to dip the whole thing away. It's acceptable to cook using the cracked glass, but not if it's on television. Yeah. So is it all right to murder people as long as you don't murder people on television? <laughs> The kitchen is just the place for a philosophical debate about the nature of reality. It's like making lunch for Jean-Paul Sartre and all his mates. Sauce tartare with new unbroken glass, take two. Whilst they're cooking, we can make the garnish, which is going to be sauce tartare. First, you put a healthy blob of salad cream into a jar like this, tablespoonful, something like that. And then to this, you add a roughly equal amount of sandwich spread. Heaped teaspoon, like that. Stir these vigorously together, being very careful not to break the glass whilst you do it. Right, the fish fingers have been in for five minutes. That's what they should look like. Slightly browned. Slightly seared, as it would be if this was a piece of tuna in an expensive gastro pub. It isn't. It is the Man Lab kitchen. They are likely burned. The fish finger was designed so that five would fit into a sandwich. Four in that direction and one across the top there. They fit exactly onto a British standard size slice of white bread. The fish fingers are now ready and this is how you arrange them. One, two, three, four, and then one across the top like that. Tartar sauce, liberally applied to the top. Put the top piece of bread on. Now remember, four fish fingers are going that way, one is going that way. Which way do you cut it? I think the answer is that way. You get precisely two and a half fish fingers in each half the sandwich. It isn't quite the feeding of the 5,000, but as the old saying goes, teach me to fish and I will eat for a lifetime. Give me a fish in the form of fingers and I will eat for a lunchtime or something. Mm. Oh, hot. Mm. Oh, I've just hot. cooked it, you imbecile. Mm. Nice. God, I'm exhausted. Let's do something else. When mowing the lawn at home, it's always a good idea to have a refreshing jug of ginger beer and some fortifying jam sandwiches to hand on your garden picnic table. That's fine if you have a normal-sized garden, but what if you have a lawn of 40 acres, like we do at ManLab? This is boring. I think I'll have a word with my friend, Simi. So, James, what have we got? We've got an electric um, wheelchair here with a joystick which controls um, movement back, forward, left and right. And we're going to take that and we're going to attach it to our picnic table right. so we can drive our picnic table around. 
by remote control. Do you have to, does somebody have to sit on the picnic table, you mean, to drive it? No, we'll have a handheld transmitter. Oh, actual radio controlled. Actually radio ah. controlled. This could be a work of genius. These wheelchairs are examples of exceptional electronic engineering. The big wheels each contain an individual motor and gearbox. We're taking these and attaching them to our picnic table. Like so. Sim has recycled a two-channel FM transmitter and receiver. Once this was used for a radio-controlled toy boat, we have a higher purpose for it. To mimic the movement of the joystick on the wheelchair, Sim has had to be rather cunning. This is a transmitter, receiver, servos. All a servo is is a motor inside here which is controlled by the receiver left and right. And what we're going to do now is attach the servos to these two little sliders so, in effect, we can get it to go forward and backwards, left and right. This is now all hooked up. Um, this is our original joystick. We now have left and right and forward and reverse. This groundbreaking technology could be applied to mundane static objects across the globe. Beds, sofas and even bar stools could be liberated to run free like the wind. The moment of truth. It's a triumph, one that will surely see Sim joining the ranks of Stevenson, Bell and Logie Baird as another great British inventor. Now, whenever I mow the lawn, I need never be more than a few feet from my picnic table laden with ginger beer and jam sandwiches. But, like all new inventions, this one is not without its flaws. I can make the table follow me, but that still means I have to walk when I mow. Time to add my own stamp to Sim's masterful invention. Earlier in the show, I went head to head with this ticking bomb unearthed in the man lab garden. This lethal device, packed with a payload of cow poo and celebrity male fragrance, has been ticking for the last three hours. I've attempted to stop the timer by pumping salty water into the fuse to gum up the clockwork mechanism. Now, as I return to the pit, I have no idea if the process has been successful. Here's a very sobering thought. I've read this process in an old book from the 1940s put together by bomb disposal experts who originally learned this sequence of operations by trial and error, and getting it right probably cost several lives. Several people became what they call the pink mist. So those people were unspeakably brave to do this. I mean, it's quite frightening knowing that it's just full of perfume and poo, but if it was a real 500 kilogram high explosive bomb, this would be Oh, it's, it's unthinkable. Right, this is the moment of truth. The stethoscope is working, I can hear my own watch. It's stopped. It's stopped. That's fantastic. Salt water has defeated the enemy. That's just brilliant. Right, all I've got to do is get it out. And once the fuse is out, this is simply a barrel of explosives, completely inert as it is. Without a trigger, it can't do anything. So, here we go. All 
clear, everyone. All clear. How about that? <laughs> Go, 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 go. So, what can possibly have gone wrong? How can I be covered in cow poo and conditional? The latest male fragrance from Peter Andre. <laughs> For an answer, I invite you back to Man Lab. Now, I do wish to boast that I did successfully disable the clockwork mechanism. You can see here, look, that there's plenty of salt in there gumming up the clockwork so that the charge can't be used to fire the fuse. But what I didn't know, you see, was that the bomb also included the very fiendish Zeus 40 booby trap fuse. And it's designed to be triggered when you remove the original fuse. That little spring is released and sets the whole bomb off. That is why, and I'm obliged by our lawyers to say this, you must never, ever try this at home. Good night.